let's look at some examples of independent samples t-tests. One way to think about the t-statistic is that's a is that's a ratio of signal to noise. What is the difference between the two groups, between their means, relative to the noise or the random variability that would arise or come up just from chance alone? So when we calculate this t-statistic in the numerator, we'll see what is the difference between the two means. And what it gets divided by is what is the standard error of that difference in means. A few examples um, of this, I'll, I'll show you a second, but the, this, this shows you that the numerator, you can have different null hypotheses. Usually we're testing our two means equal to each other, but sometimes you can choose a different null hypothesis. Maybe you might say that the standard treatment lowers blood pressure by 10 points. And I want to test and see if my thing is better than 10 points. You can plug that into the numerator. The denominator we see, we can either calculate variances in two different ways. The top here shows the pooled standard deviation, where we assume that there's equal variance within each group. And the bottom one here shows when you use different variances for each group. We'll always use this formula up here at the top. I wanna show you a couple of examples from the literature. Here are some data on the relationship between parental education and kids' soft drink consumption. This is a great example of an independent samples t-test. We think about this mental image of an independent samples t-test. We have the continuous variable that we're gonna compare the means between each group. We have one group here, one group here, and then we compare the means. So parental education, what type of variable is that? Well, education really, it could be a continuous variable in a way. How many minutes of your life have you spent in school? That's depressing, don't do the math on that. In this study, education is conceptualized as binary, low or high. So we have our two groups, right? This would be uh, low and this would be high. And then we need a continuous outcome variable for which we can calculate the mean. And here it is right here, soft drink intake by adolescence. And so what we see here is that this study was done at two time points. We see at the at baseline, children of parents with low education had a mean soft drink consumption of 6.7. Parents of children with higher education had a mean soft drink consumption of 4.6. I'm looking to see what, what the units are um, on here. I don't see it. Oh, I see it right here. It's in the title right here. Deciliters per week. I don't really know what that is, but we, we can see that it's higher in one group than the other. Now, can you write to a journal and say, hey, 6.7, bigger than 4.6? No, you have to do a statistical test. You have to say that could be due to chance alone. What's the probability that if these two groups are the same, I would get a difference like that? And that's called the p-value. That's what that is. So 6.7 compared to 4.6, we see the p-value is less than 0 0.001. So there is evidence of a significantly more soft drink consumption by kids of parents with low education compared to kids with parents of high education. Statistically significant. Now, we always want to ask that follow-up question. Is it clinically relevant? This is deciliters per week. 2.1 more deciliters per week. I'll leave that to you to look up and see what a deciliter is and whether you think that might be clinically relevant. Here's another really interesting example. This comes from the British Medical Journal. Every year on Christmas, they release an edition of... Um, just like goofy studies. And uh, some of them are fun. Some of them are, are like tongue in cheek. Um, this is a really cool one about learning how to play the didgeridoo in order to control sleep apnea. The didgeridoo, I'll show you a picture on the next slide, but you, you know what that is. It's that giant long reed instrument. The way this study was done, you learned how to play the didgeridoo or you didn't. There was a control group. 
And they used a measurement on the Epworth sleepiness scale. The Epworth sleepiness scale is a test where they ask you things like, if you were in a car right after you had eaten a high carb lunch, how likely are you to fall asleep? If you were in the middle of a statistics lecture that you were watching on your phone, how likely are you to fall asleep? All these sort of questions. And you calculate how sleepy you are. This is a test that's used to see sort of someone's general like sleep health. Now, what we see in this study is that people who learn how to play the didgeridoo after four months, their mean Epworth score was 7.4. People who are in the control group, their mean Epworth score was 9.6. This changed from baseline. This group went down negative 4.4. That's how much the didgeridoo improves your sleep. The control group went down 1.4. This is important. This is called the placebo effect. Even if you do something to people that doesn't do anything at all, they'll tend to show some sort of improvement. You'll learn a lot about that in epidemiology. But here we see the difference between these two groups. This group improved. This group improved. How much more did the didgeridoo group improve? Well, the difference there is three. We can take that three and we can say, is it statistically significant or not? So if you notice right here, we see that three and there's a confidence interval around it. That confidence interval does not include zero. It doesn't include the null value. So this tells you that the didgeridoo induces a, sorry, training for the didgeridoo induces a statistically significant improvement in the Epworth scale. Now, because that confidence interval does not include zero, you can see that the p-value is statistically significant. It's a 95% CI, which doesn't include zero, so the p-value will be less than 0.05. Now, again, the follow-up question, is that a clinically relevant difference? What is three points on the Epworth sleepiness scale? I don't know. I'm not, an, I'm not an expert in sleep at all. I suck at it. But I, I have a hunch that three points is not very meaningful on this scale. And, and one, one reason why I think that is if you look at this control group, these people who had nothing done to them, their score improved by 1.4. So just by doing nothing to people, you can move them about a point and a half. Going through learning how to play the didgeridoo, induces a difference of a few points. So my hunch is that this is probably not worth it. Although you do get to look like this when you play the didgeridoo. I love this figure one man playing didgeridoo. So we see the primary outcome improved significantly in the group compared to the control group. And the difference is three units. They report the 95% CI. Again, you can see that it does not include the null value and so that it must be statistically significant at the 0.05 level.